The Red Sox August slate begins tonight against the Texas Rangers. Joining us now is Dan Roach, who's also covering the Patriots in Foxborough. Dan, let's first talk about the trade deadline, though, that, that came and went. The Red Sox did make some ads to this major league roster at the trade deadline. What did you think of the job that Craig Breslow did? I think he did uh, enough to appease uh, everybody, right? The, we, we talked about this ad nauseum about, you know, doing something, showing something to the team. Uh, job well done. You got us this far. He didn't panic when the Red Sox were coming out three and seven or what have you out of the all-star break. Uh, I thought he stuck to his guns, uh, got them a starter, got them a couple of relievers, got them a bat. So I, I thought he did a pretty good job, to be honest with you, Joe. Uh, it wasn't a wow factor. It wasn't a franchise type of player. It wasn't a big trade where you give up the farm. So I think that was kind of what they were trying to do, right? So it was not give up the top prospects. We've talked about that. Roman Anthony and Marcelo Meyer, who's now hurting on the seven-day DL for a, a, a quick stint. Uh, but there's none of that stuff going on. It's more like, hey, we gave up some prospects, maybe some guys that are going to be Rule 5 draft eligible uh, in, in the uh, coming year. And, and they got back guys that are going to help them. And again, we've talked about, you know, Alex Gordon wants players that can play on the big league level. And I think he's accomplished that. So, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was a pretty good trade deadline. It wasn't a wild one, but I think it will help the Red Sox going forward for these final 55 games uh, of the season. Yeah, and here are the players that the Red Sox did add. They, they added James Paxton, of course, the starter, as you mentioned. They added a couple bullpen guys, Luis Garcia, Lucas Sims, who we already saw in that game against the Mariners. Also, Danny Jansen was another player that got added. D, uh, Reese McGuire ends up getting DFA'd. So Jansen now that backup catcher and another right-handed bat. And uh, then on top of that, they make a prospect per prospect really type move with dealing Nick York and getting a pitcher back in Quinn Priester. Dan, what I think I liked about it the most is that unlike years past where it was a little bit wishy-washy in terms of what the team was trying to do, this team knew for, you know, for certain that they were going to be a buyer and they went out and did that. The question will end up being, did they do enough? But Right away, you see a guy like Lucas Sims help out a bullpen that's depleted and Danny Jansen already delivering when he got <laughs> a chance to play, too. So I, I like that they've already added pieces and these pieces are already helping this team out, knowing that they're fighting for a playoff spot. I liked how Jansen was ripped and crushed by everybody for not, you know, why are they picking up him? He's uh, having a really bad year offensively and he's, what, four for seven. You know, I mean, that, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the beauty of baseball, but. Uh, I thought that was an analytics, analytics trade, you know, with uh, the fact that he can get the ball up in the air, right-handed bat at Fenway Park. Uh, you know, so I thought that was an interesting move. And I thought, like you said, too, uh, you know, the, the fact that Sims and Garcia, they're better. They're, they're guys that can pitch in the big league level. You know what I mean? And, and again, that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for AAA guys that might be able to help out of the bullpen. They need help right now because, let's face it, their arms are a bit gassed out there. Uh, you know, and, and Paxton, if he can be at that number five spot starter or what have you, then OK. And, and again, I go back to the fact that they didn't give up any big prospects. Uh, you know, I like Nico Cavetis. Uh, I like uh, Nick York. Um, but, you know, on that level, it's like, OK, so you're going to have to give up something. So I thought and I thought, like you said, they were very determined to get the job done. So. Uh, you know, I, I'll give them, uh, you know, the, the benefit of the doubt here, especially I don't think anybody thinks they're going to win the World Series this year, Joe. So, you know, <clears throat> I don't think they had to go out and make that kind of push. Uh, but now, again, steps in the right direction. Alex Cora signed to a long term deal and you, you started, hey, we're going to back you up here. Craig Breslow said he would. And we have added to this team. And now you look to the offseason as well and see what they can do over the next several years to complement what they have and the core guys that they hope to have up here too. So I think if you're a Red Sox fan, what do we talk about at the beginning of the season, Joe? You want to see hope, right? That's what you want to see as a baseball fan. They understand where they're at as a franchise and what they're trying to do, but you don't lie and don't try to sell them a bill of goods. Here, this is what we're doing, and these are the reasons why, and they went out and did it. So I think if you're a Red Sox fan right now, at least today, you're pretty satisfied, like I said, with 55 games to go in the season and them right in the thick of it. Yeah, and I think you, you hit on a couple of big things there, Dan. 
the, the, the further we get away from the trade deadline, the more I like what Craig Breslow did. I, I, I think somewhere, if you want to give it a grade, I think a, a fair one maybe is somewhere in that, that B to C plus range, I think. But I, I what I like is that he straddled the line of adding to this team while knowing maybe this year isn't the year that they're world, a World Series contender. But he helped him out, and he didn't give away any of those top guys that, that we've talked about, the big three, Marcelo Meyer, Kyle Teal, Roman Anthony, and even a guy like Christian Campbell either. Nick York was a Rule 5 eligible guy. You trade him away and you get starting pitching depth in Quinn Priester that this organization sorely needs. So they hit a couple of needs here at the trade deadline and ultimately filled them, and that's what I like most about what they ended up doing. The question is, the Royals also you know, added at the deadline. The Yankees also added at the deadline. The Mariners also added at the deadline. So can they jump into the, you know, the playoff conversation, you know, whether it's the Royals falling off or maybe a team like the twins too, that didn't add at all because while they didn't add the Red Sox at least did something. So we'll kind of see how it all plays out. Yeah. And I think, you know, we were talking about the schedule before we came on it. It's just, it's a tough schedule for the month of August. It's, you know, they play the Texas Rangers, I think, six times. They play the Astros, the Orioles. Uh, it's not an easy schedule. They're facing teams that are right there in the thick of it and, and you know, near atop their divisions. So it's not going to be easy at all uh, this month of August. But uh, I think they set themselves up to at least battle, and that's part of it too. And God forbid we talk about other sports on these types of things. Joe, people get so mad when you bring up other sports teams in this town. But I look at, like, the Red Sox almost like the Patriots with what they're doing with Drake May and, and the team that they have and not necessarily didn't go out and make that big splash in free agency, but they're adding guys that they hope maybe over the next two years can kind of set them up for where they want to be a contender year in and year out to win a Super Bowl. And it's almost like the Celtics. They kept adding and moving and changing parts and finding the right chemistry. And last year was the year they went for it, right? They added Drew Holiday. They added Porzingis. And lo and behold, they, they led them and helped lead them to a championship. Neither of these franchises, the Red Sox or the Patriots, are there. And it's almost like the Bruins. The Bruins have added when they need to and try to make a run here. But at the same time, they're leery of also, you know, mixing guys in and trying to get them to the level where they want to be, where they can just add that one big free agent or two big free agents and say, now we're good, let's go. And I think that's, the, to me, the Red Sox look like a, a, a pro franchise, which is, I think, what everybody was kind of leery of going into this season. What the heck are they doing? They're a rudderless ship. There's, you know, management ownership doesn't care. I think at least now they're, they're trending in that right direction as they go up. All right. So I think uh, we'll see what happens. For the people that have still stuck with this video, even though Dan ultimately shifted gears and brought in some different sports. Right. You're right. You're right. I think you're completely right. This team does have direction and it's the, the vibes are good, Dan. And it's such a contrast to where we were at the beginning of the season where everyone came into this year and thought, all right, they're playing. We know the Red Sox are going to have an actual season, but how good are they going to be? Now you look to the long-term future. It's very bright, very bright, just like your disposition every day. <laughs> All right, are you done? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> well, here's what the schedule is coming up for the Red Sox. And as I mentioned, three on the road here against Texas, three against Kansas City on the road. Then they come back home to play the Astros, Rangers, then the Orioles for four on the road, Houston for three on the road, then the Diamondbacks, the NL reigning champs at th at home for three. Then they close out the month with some easy teams in Toronto and Detroit. But Dan, I, I think what we what we were talking about the, the the bullpen ads and how important that's been for a team that prior to getting them, they've really struggled from the bullpen perspective. This offense right now is a juggernaut and there are so many different players contributing to a team that finished second in the sport in July in average, second in on-base percentage, and second in slugging percentage. Yeah, they're fun to watch, you know what I mean? And it's just like you said, it's just, you know, you look at different guys up and down the lineup, and they're all, you know, making contr uh, contributions. And it's kind of a, a joy to watch. And unfortunately, the starting pitching's fallen down a little bit, uh, had a hiccup, and the bullpen is maybe gassed a little bit. So you hope in the month of August, maybe the, the two come together near it near and dear to each other and they they win some four to three games and some you know two to one games and it's kind of make it fun that's what you're hoping for as a red sox fan at the same time it's a really hard schedule as you if you think about it it's if they get through this month of august joe and they're still in good playoff position and playoff shape kudos to them 
uh, for going above and beyond because you're right. It's, it's not an easy schedule, an easy thing to look at when it comes to what they're trying to accomplish. But yeah, the offense has been fun. Just watching different guys come through. It's, it's on a nightly basis. And then watching Devers do what he does. Uh, it, it, it's pretty special to watch this team as they go forward. Yeah, Devers had one of his best months of his career. He's a guy that's always hit in the month of July, Dan. And and once again, he was phenomenal, and he closed it out in perfect way, hitting that walk-off hit to close out the Mariners series. But it's not just guys like him. It's it's guys like Dom Smith who have also been huge for this team. And, you know, he was a guy that you thought, okay, if he can just fill first base competently, this team might be in a decent position with Tristan Costas out. But in the month of July, he was more than that. Yeah, and Alex Cora called him Wade Boggs the other day. That's how great he's been. And I thought Julian McWilliams wrote a, a really nice story in the Globe on Friday <clears throat> talking about his swing and how Pete Fatsy went to him and said, let's go look at your swing. And I looked up your high school swing, and you have beautiful soft hands. Why don't you hit like that anymore? And basically, as a first-round pick, was told, if you're going to succeed in the big leagues, you got to do this, 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 and this. And it reminded me somewhat of Jackie Bradley Jr., you know, his two-time uh, college World Series champ in South Carolina. He kind of led them uh, on that, you know, that, that, that championship run. He was a great hitter. And he had his moments in Boston, but I feel like so many people tried to mess with his swing. And I think the, the human body is, is cool from the sense of in baseball, you really look at it, no swing is alike, no batting stance. Everybody's different. And then you look at pitching, same thing, every delivery, even though they're trying to do the same thing over and over again, everybody's delivery is different. It's just human nature and the way things are. And I think people, the experts and the scouts, and I take nothing away from the talent evaluators and the coaches, the hitting coaches, what have you, but you, you wish guys that what got you here basically is what he said to, to Dom Smith and Smith said doing this. And now he seems to be kind of going back in that and look at the way he's hitting and producing. So uh, I know there are holes in swings and what have you that people find, but I found it refreshing. And those are the guys like Dom Smith that I root for just to see the fact that like, Hey, if I just don't think and hit, uh, look what I can produce. And it's kind of cool to watch him take off like that this year at first base. Yeah, he, and he really enjoys being here in Boston too, Dan. I had a chance to catch up with him before a game a couple of weeks ago, and, and he talked about just the joy he's had playing at Fenway Park, the opportunity and, and being with this franchise specifically. And I love the sign from a, a Red Sox fan. His name is Tyler, and uh, you can find it on Twitter. This sign is amazing. And the Red Sox have kind of co-opted it in a way because they put a tweet out that related to the sign. It said, he's not the step first baseman. He's the first baseman who stepped up. And he has been. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And that's kind of, yes. It, and a lot of people say, well, he took, you know, get to court. Why are you playing this kid? Why are you playing him? You know, he's got, he got released. Why are you playing him? You know, and it's just like Alex sees things. And again, that's what makes him a, a really good manager. He sees things and sticks with guys. I believe in him and what have you. And now we're seeing the fruits of that, right? So that's, that's again, yeah, good, good stuff. Good story all the way around. And let's hope it continues. And a testament to, to the job Craig Breslow has done this year that instead of just waiting around, he immediately got some help at first base when this team needed it. And here they are, entering the month of July, starting play tonight, only a couple games out of a wild card spot. But with the additions, it should make for a fun rest of the summer into September. Dan, appreciate the time as always. We love your sunny disposition with the sun glistening the car as you uh, get ready for training camp. Yeah, we got it all for you, Joe. <laughs> WVZ, we do everything for you. Okay. Everything. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yep.